why Nico wasn't in GTA 5. Well, I got a theory for you. Back when GTA 5 was in development, there were numerous rumors and speculation about familiar faces making appearances. Among these was the possibility of Nico Bellic showing up in some capacity. The theory suggests that Rockstar had plans to bring Nico into the story, possibly as a connection for Michael, Franklin, or Trevor during their heists. But this potential return may have been complicated by behind the scenes issues. Michael Hollick, the voice actor who brought Nico to life, had previously expressed dissatisfaction with his compensation for GTA 4. Despite the game's massive success, Hollick reportedly received around $100,000 for his voice work and motion capture over 15 months. A significant amount for some, but arguably modest given the game's billion dollar earnings. Chump change, basically. This is very common with the gaming industry about voice actor compensation. Many talented performers have spoken out about the challenges they face, including modest pay rates that don't align with the success of the games they contribute to. While we can't confirm if Nico was definitely planned for GTA 5, the theory makes sense when you consider how Rockstar often connects their games. We did get references to Nico in GTA 5, Lester mentions him, and he's referenced in the Liberty City section of the in-game internet. But an actual appearance? That remained off the table. Next, what if Victor Vance fooled us everyone? First, let's set the scene. In Vice City Stories, we play as Victor Vance, building up his criminal empire in 1984. Two years later, in Vice City's 1986 opening scene, we see Victor get gunned down during a drug deal gone wrong. But what if that wasn't really him? What if the real Victor orchestrated this whole thing to deceive both his brothers and his enemies? Let's look at the evidence that supports this theory. There are some interesting inconsistencies between the Victor we play as in stories and the one who dies in Vice City. The most obvious is the voice actor change, from Dorian Misik to Armando Riesco. While this was likely just a casting change, theory crafters suggest it could be evidence of a different person entirely. Then, there's the personality shift. In stories, Victor is portrayed as a principled former soldier who reluctantly enters the criminal world to help his sick brother. He's cautious and strategic. But in Vice City, he seems much more casual about the drug deal, almost careless, very out of character for the Victor we know. This theory suggests it's because this wasn't the real Victor, but a hired double. The motivation? By faking his death, Victor could potentially take control of his empire without the complications of his brothers Lance and Pete. Lance, as we see in Vice City, is impulsive and unreliable. By removing himself from the picture, Victor could operate in the shadows while letting everyone think he was dead. Now, let's think about the practical aspects. Victor had built up significant connections and resources by the end of Vice City stories. He would have had the means to find a convincing double and set up the fake drug deal. The theory suggests he may have even tipped off the hitman himself to ensure the plan went smoothly. Of course, there are some holes in this theory. For one, why would Victor trust Lance to handle the aftermath of his death? Lance proves throughout Vice City that he's not exactly the most competent criminal. Also, if Victor was alive and pulling strings behind the scenes, wouldn't he have stepped in when Tommy Versetti started taking over Vice City? There's also the question of what happened to the real Victor if this theory is true. Some suggest he might have moved to another city to start fresh, while others think he might have continued operating in Vice City under a different identity. Now what if GTA 3 ending is not what you think, and what if it was Tony who killed Maria? Here's the thing. Tony had way more motivation to kill Maria than Claude ever did. Let's rewind a bit. Salvatore Leone was like a father figure to Tony. Throughout GTA, Liberty City Stories, we see Tony doing everything to prove himself to Salvatore, taking on the most dangerous jobs and staying loyal even when Salvatore doubted him. Their relationship was deep, built on years of trust and respect. Now, Maria was Salvatore's wife, but she was never faithful to him. She constantly embarrassed Salvatore, flirting with other men and eventually running off with Claude. When Claude killed Salvatore, 
It wasn't just a boss dying. It was Tony losing his mentor, his father figure, and in many ways, his entire purpose in the Leone family. Looking at the timeline after Salvatore's death, Tony mysteriously disappears from the main story. The common assumption is that he's laying low, but what if he was actually plotting his revenge? Tony was always the most strategic of Salvatore's capos. He wouldn't just rush in guns blazing, he'd wait for the perfect moment. The silent gunshot at the end of GTA 3 takes on a whole new meaning with this theory. Claude had no real reason to kill Maria. Sure, she was annoying, but he'd just won. He had the city. Why risk unnecessary heat? But Tony? He had every reason to want her dead. To avenge Salvatore's honor and punish the woman who betrayed him. Let's talk about Tony's character for a moment. In Liberty City Stories, he proves himself to be methodical, patient, and absolutely ruthless when it comes to revenge. Remember how he dealt with his own mother when she put a hit out on him. Tony isn't someone who forgets betrayal. The way Maria dies is also telling. It's off screen, clean, professional. Exactly how Tony would do it. Claude is more of a chaos agent, leaving a trail of obvious destruction. But Tony? He'd make it look like a loose end being tied up. Just another casualty in the criminal underworld. There's also some interesting geographic evidence. The final mission takes place in Portland, the Leon family's turf. Tony would have known every shortcut, every vantage point. He could have easily tracked Claude and Maria's movements, waiting for the perfect opportunity. Now you might be wondering why wouldn't Claude mention this in future games? Well, first off, Claude never speaks. But more importantly, if Tony did kill Maria, Claude might have actually appreciated it. It solved a problem for him without him having to get his hands dirty. In the crime world, sometimes the best murders are the ones you can plausibly deny. What makes this theory even more interesting is how it recontextualizes the ending of GTA 3. It's not just about Claude's victory anymore. It's about the old guard of the Leon family getting their final revenge. It adds a layer of tragedy to the story showing how the consequences of betrayal can catch up to you even when you think you've won. Another bizarre one is this theory. Let's talk about one of the most controversial moments in GTA 5, the apparent death of Johnny Klebitz. While we all saw Trevor's brutal encounter with the lost MC leader, I've uncovered some interesting details that suggest Johnny might not be as dead as we thought. Even more intriguing, there's evidence pointing to plans for his return in one of GTA Fire's cancelled DLCs. First, let's break down what we actually see in that infamous scene. Trevor stomps on Johnny's head, and we assume he's dead. But here's the thing. We never actually see a corpse. In the GTA universe, that's significant. This is a series that usually isn't shy about showing deaths in graphic detail. Yet Johnny's death happens largely off-screen. Now, let's talk medical reality. While head trauma is obviously severe, people have survived similar injuries. There are countless real-world cases of individuals surviving extreme head trauma and ending up in comas. The human body can be surprisingly resilient, especially when medical help arrives quickly. This brings us to an interesting detail the location of the attack. It happened near Sandy Shores Medical Center. In the chaos following Trevor's rampage, it's entirely possible that someone could have found Johnny and gotten him emergency medical care. The GTA world has shown some pretty miraculous medical capabilities. Just look at how quickly our protagonists heal from gunshot wounds. But the real meat of this theory comes from examining the evidence of canceled DLC content for GTA 5. Originally, Rockstar had plans for several story expansions. Data miners have found references to eight different DLC packs in the game's code. One of these, interestingly, had references to the Lost MC. These breadcrumbs paint an intriguing picture. Imagine a DLC where we discover Johnny survived, but is in a coma. It would have been a perfect setup for a story about revenge, redemption, or even a deeper exploration of the biker culture that the Lost MC represented. Maybe Johnny would wake up to find his club in shambles, 
setting the stage for a comeback story. Looking at the bigger picture, Johnny's survival would make sense narratively. His apparent death, while shocking, felt abrupt for a character who had starred in his own game. The Lost and Damned built Johnny up as a tough, resilient leader. Having him go out so quickly felt out of character for both him and the series. There's also the matter of Ashley, Johnny's troubled girlfriend. After Johnny's death, we only hear about her own death through a news report. Could this have been misdirection? A way to tie up loose ends while the real story was meant to unfold in the DLC? When you look at GTA V's development history, it's clear that a lot of content was cut for time. Rockstar had ambitious plans for post-launch expansions, similar to what they did with GTA IV. The cancelled DLCs represent storylines and ideas that were developed but never saw the light of day. The timing lines up too. Around when GTA V's single-player DLCs were cancelled, Rockstar shifted focus to GTA Online. Of course, we'll probably never know for sure what was planned for these cancelled DLCs, but the evidence we do have paints a compelling picture. Johnny Klebitz, the resilient leader of the Lost, surviving against all odds, lying in a coma while the world thinks he's dead. It would have been one hell of a story. Next, Michael might have been a skinhead in Manhunt. Let's start with what we know for certain. In Grand Theft Auto V, Michael occasionally mentions spending time in Carcer City during his youth. These aren't just throwaway lines, they're deliberately placed breadcrumbs about his past. Carcer City, as we know from Manhunt, was a cesspool of gang activity in the late 80s and early 90s, right when Michael would have been a young man. Now look at Michael in the North Yankton prologue. Completely bald, aggressive, and much more ruthless than the Michael we know in Los Santos. Sure, being bald doesn't automatically make someone a skinhead, but combined with other evidence, it starts to paint an interesting picture. Consider Michael's complex relationship with race throughout GTA V. He's not overtly racist like some characters, but there are moments where he lets slip some questionable views. He's clearly uncomfortable around Franklin at first, and some of his dialogue choices hint at a man who's trying to suppress certain beliefs or past behaviors. This brings us to Jimmy, Michael's son. Jimmy's online behavior, including his frequent use of racial slurs while gaming and his general offensive persona, might not just be typical teenage edgelord behavior. The theory suggests this is learned behavior, echoes of attitudes he picked up from Michael during his younger years, despite Michael's attempts to move past that life. When we look at Michael's character arc, him having a racist past actually adds layers to his redemption story. He's not just trying to escape his criminal history, but also a hateful ideology. His friendship with Franklin becomes even more meaningful. It's not just crossing class boundaries, but also overcoming his own prejudices. Some interesting parallels emerge when we examine Carcer City's history. The Skins were known for being more than just racist thugs. They were organized, capable of complex criminal operations. This fits perfectly with Michael's later expertise in planning heists. Maybe his tactical skills weren't just from watching old movies, but from his time running with a disciplined, albeit hateful, gang. Michael's obsession with movies and reinvention takes on a new light with this theory. Classic films often show characters trying to escape their past and reinvent themselves. Exactly what Michael might be trying to do if he's hiding a history with a white supremacist gang. His whole Los Santos life could be seen as an attempt to rewrite his personal script. Looking at Michael's mansion, it's notable that despite all his wealth, there are no photos or mementos from before his time with Trevor and Brad. If he was trying to hide a shameful past involvement with the Skins, erasing all evidence of his youth in Carcer City would make perfect sense. The theory also adds weight to Michael's therapy sessions with Dr. Friedlander. His guilt might not just be about his criminal actions but about his former beliefs. When he talks about being a different person in his youth, it might be about more than just his criminal activities. Some of Michael's extreme reactions to his family's behavior could be explained by this past too. His desperate attempts to steer Jimmy away from being a loser might be fueled by more than just typical parental concern. He might be terrified of his son following a similar path towards hateful ideologies. Even Michael's choice of Los Santos as his witness protection home could be significant. It's one of the most diverse cities in the GTA universe, about as far as you could get from the ideology of his theoretical skins days. 
Perhaps this was intentional, a way to ensure his past stayed buried. There's also the nature of Michael's relationship with Dave Norton and the FIB. They might have chosen him for witness protection not just because he was willing to turn on his crew, but because they had additional leverage, knowledge of his past involvement with a hate group. Now, this theory isn't without its holes. The timeline can be a bit fuzzy, and some might argue it goes against Michael's character. But that's exactly the point. It's supposed to be a hidden, shameful part of his past that he's desperately tried to overcome. In many ways, this theory transforms Michael's story from a simple tale of a criminal trying to reform into something much more complex. A man trying to unlearn hate, to be better than his past self, and to prevent his children from absorbing the toxic beliefs he once held. Now, I got another Tony Cipriani theory, and this one is, far crazy what if Tony killed CJ? Let's start with what we know. Before the events of Liberty City stories, Tony goes into exile for killing a made man. This is mentioned multiple times in GTA 3, and it's treated as common knowledge. But here's where it gets interesting. We never learn who this made man was, or why Tony killed him. What if this was just a cover story? Think about Salvatore Leone's situation after San Andreas. CJ had completely dismantled the Leone family's operations on the West Coast. He'd humiliated them, cost them a fortune, and worst of all, he'd gotten away with it. Anyone who knows Salvatore knows he wouldn't let this slide. But he's also smart enough to know that sending an army after CJ would be suicide. He'd need someone subtle, someone patient, someone absolutely loyal. He'd need Tony Cipriani. The timing fits perfectly. There's a significant gap between San Andreas and Liberty City stories. Plenty of time for Tony to track down CJ, study his routines, and wait for the perfect moment. Remember, Tony is a master of the long game. In Liberty City stories, we see him spending months laying low, building up resources, waiting for the right time to strike. Now, let's look at some interesting details. In Liberty City stories, set after Tony's return from exile, there are zero mentions of CJ, despite his legendary status. The Made Man story is also suspiciously vague. In the mob world, killing a made man is a huge deal. The identity of the victim would normally be widely known. The fact that it's kept so quiet suggests this might be a cover for something even bigger. Killing a made man would require Tony to lay low, sure. But killing someone like CJ? That would require completely disappearing for years. There's also the matter of Tony's fighting style in Liberty City stories. If you pay attention, you'll notice he's adapted his technique to counter CJ's strengths. He's better at dealing with multiple attackers. He's improved his shooting while moving, exactly the kind of skills you'd need to take down someone with CJ's abilities. Consider the psychological angle too. Later in GTA 3, Tony seems different, more reserved, almost haunted. This fits with someone who's taken down a legend, someone who's done something that's changed the entire criminal landscape. He's not just laying low from the mob, he's laying low from history. Looking at Salvatore's behavior, this theory makes even more sense. He trusts Tony absolutely in GTA 3, more than any other capo. What could earn that level of trust? Taking out the Leone family's greatest enemy would do it. Salvatore knows Tony has proven himself beyond any doubt. Now, some might argue that CJ was too powerful, too well protected to be taken down by one man. But that's exactly what makes Tony the perfect assassin. CJ would be looking out for armies, for rival gangs. He wouldn't be watching for one patient, methodical soldier who'd spent years planning his approach. The method of the kill would have been crucial. It couldn't look like a hit. Everything we know about Tony suggests he would have made it look like an accident or a random act of violence. This explains why we never hear about CJ's death, because officially, it wasn't a murder at all. This theory also adds a new layer to Claude's story in GTA 3. Maybe the real reason Salvatore tries to kill Claude isn't just about paranoia or Maria. It's because Claude is starting to show the same kind of potential that CJ had, and Salvatore isn't taking any chances this time. Is this what really happened to CJ? Did the legend of Grove Street fall to the patient, methodical plotting of Salvatore's most loyal soldier? We may never know for sure, and we are done. So these were some of the lesser known GTA theories. 
I'm sure you haven't heard of them anywhere else often. Now you can subscribe to show support and tell me in the comments if you want to see more videos like this. Thanks for watching.